thank you for coming to my webinar. And first of all, I want to thank Dr. Christina Vasari, who's been my mentor over uh, 25 years or so. And uh, being invited to this program is an honor for me. I'm going to be joined by my guest today, Mark Glycini, who is a professional lacrosse player. So as we proceed through the presentation, you'll hear from him and he will be explaining his experiences of what he's had to go through with COVID, you know, as a professional athlete, not being able to play for a while, and they'll give you some good news about what's gonna happen with lacrosse um, in a short period of time. My background uh, is as a clinical and counseling psychologist. I've had a lot of experience working in sport. Here are some of the organizations I've been affiliated with. As the credits are running, telling you a little bit more about my background, I can tell you that my experience started many years ago as a teacher, and I became a school psychologist, director of special services, and eventually finished my doctorate. After doing so, I became involved in auto racing. My grandfather raced in the Indianapolis 500 in 1919, and so if you go back to the archives in Indianapolis, you'll see my name in 1919. My grandfather was a riding mechanic uh, during a race and there was an accident. My grandfather was seriously injured. The driver was killed. He was a riding mechanic back at those times. There were no rear view mirrors on the car, so he had to tell the driver when to pass. If the car broke down, they fixed it out on the track. I also had an auto accident uh, racing my race car, and that's how I got into sports psychology. I had a concussion and broke my arm and figured if I was going to race, I could no longer be frightened. I found a way not to be frightened. And that started my career in sports psychology many years ago. I'd like to introduce you to now Mark Glycini. Mark, as you can see, is a uh, player for the Premier Lacrosse League and the National Lacrosse League that does indoor uh, box across, I think, out in San Diego. Is that correct, Mark? That is correct, yes. And it's been an honor for me to be here as well. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure and an opportunity to uh, be here. Thank you, Dr. Christina Versari. And as Dr. Nick talked about um, his student and mentorship under Dr. Christina Versari, I feel the same way about Dr. Nick. Uh, I'm in my fifth year in professional lacrosse. Uh, I work as a certified fitness trainer and nutritionist um, and a mental performance coach. Um, and it's been such a pleasure uh, to get to know and build a relationship with Dr. Nick for the better part of two years. I cherish our relationship. Uh, I love our conversations. And I'm sure today's going to be a great one as well. Thank you, Mark. So uh, one of the things I'd like to begin with is because we're talking about the impact that COVID has had on all of us. And uh, in my training uh, in performance psychology before I became a sports psychologist, it's really about the uh, development of the human condition. So I've done a lot of work in existential uh, and phenomenological uh, psychology, and certainly Viktor Frankl is one of the best to help us understand the human condition. So it's interesting to begin with here is that everything can be taken from us. Uh, you know, the last of our human freedoms is what we choose to do. And so it's about choice. It's always about choice. We make thousands of decisions a day, thousands of decisions a day, and they're all based upon our choice, most of which are subconscious. So you cannot even think quickly enough to say the words you're gonna say when somehow our subconscious mind is influencing us. Those of you who are involved in sports, either as an athlete or as a, a performance psychologist or a mental coach, know that all of what we're really doing here is trying to stay out of the way of our subconscious mind because our subconscious mind directs us all the time in performance. And so what Frankl was saying back then, if you know Viktor Frankl, a Jewish psychiatrist in Nazi Germany, uh, and I think it was um, Auschwitz, I may believe is uh, the, where he was uh, held, and his man's search for meaning, I would highly, highly recommend this is my quote about high level performers really are not frightened of failure. They continuously rely on faith and their ability to perform optimally in every moment of every day. 
we have an opportunity, we'll spend some time talking about faith and differentiate faith from trust. It's an essential, pro pre essential process in high-level performance. Those of you may have seen this, if you've seen any of my presentations before. So I'm just going to run through this and take a look at what you see. And most of you will probably see a box in the center here. And you may see the box on top of the four circles, or you may see the box with Pac-Man-like uh, attributes to the side. There was never a box there. Now, the reason I bring this up is for several. One is that it's about truth. What you see is not necessarily what you get. So in your experiences currently, for anyone as an athlete, a coach, parent, we are being affected by what we're seeing and what we are believing, which might not even be the truth. We're always after the truth. The other reason I bring this up, and just you know, for those of you who are athletes, is for what we describe as attentional shifting. Keep your attention only on that one three-quarter circle. Try not to see the square. Now, although I've asked you not to do that, sometimes telling you not to do something may actually influence you. All sports are based upon attentional shifting. Where your attention is at execution makes all the difference. And I can thank uh, Dr. Robert Knight of her who spoke earlier today on the use of the test of attentional and diversional style. The phenomenon of attentional shifting is really attributed to Bob's work. Some of you may have seen this before as well. What letter does not belong? The reason I'm bringing this up before we start our presentation is to try to help you think differently. All of what I can do is to help you gather information and learn from another perspective. That's what I'm trying to do now. I'm sure all of you have read a paragraph, and after you've read the paragraph, you don't remember what you've read. If I said, read a new paragraph and find the two most important points in that paragraph, I think you would read it differently. That is, your intention will drive your attention, your attention will drive your decision-making, and then your behavior. What are you intending on doing in this webinar? Listening, analyzing, creating, juxtaposing information that you're hearing from me as compared to some of the things you may have learned before. So I'm gonna ask you to have an intention. My intention is to give you information and help you kind of gather that information in a way that maybe you can apply it to yourself differently than maybe you have done before. That's at least one of my intentions. Part of my model here is based upon the concept of uh, understanding. You can know something and understand it or not understand it. You can understand something and not believe it or believe it. You can believe things that are not true, believe things that are true. You can either not value the truth or value it, and then the decision is about whether or not you're going to apply it. If I wanna know what a person actually believes, I mean, you're working in performance, what do you actually believe? You may say you believe something, but unless you're demonstrating that with consistency, it may not actually be your belief. People believe things that are not true. People go to war, die, and kill other people based upon what they believe in spite of the fact that it's not true. What's your truth? And then what is the truth? We're looking for the truth. No one speaks to you more than you do. Interesting concept. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. You have about 80,000 thoughts a day. So you can tell already, those of you who are psychologists, this is cognitive behavioral phenomenon, right? So that we're impacted by a number of thoughts on a daily basis, some of which you know, are constructions by our perceptions. The glass is neither half full nor half empty. The truth about that, most people only think there's two examples of that metaphor, but the third one is the truth. There's four ounces in an eight ounce glass, eight ounces in a 16 ounce glass. Are you working with the truth or are you working with perceptions? I 
Thinking is like breathing. I love this metaphor. Now your breathing occurs spontaneously, sometimes even rhythmically, but you don't have to think about your breathing. But I could ask you to hold your breath. I could ask you to breathe quicker. You know, increase your respirations. You could breathe from your thoracic area or your diaphragm. So just as you can control your breathing, you can control your thinking. That's essential in performance. It's essential in being able to manage stress. So as we go through this, please become aware of what you're thinking about and seeing whether or not those thoughts are real, accurate, distractions, influences uh, in your performance. I told you not to think about pink elephants. What are you thinking about? So it's interesting that, you know, when we look at how we're going to manage our stress, it's really based upon how we're experiencing it and what we are believing and what we were thinking at the time we were being affected. In the model of the rational mind and emotional mind, there's the wise mind. So those of you who understand the brain anatomy, so rational processing, left hemisphere, more kind of emotional stuff happening on the right hemisphere. But the process in between is how we gather the information and make decisions. So we go back now to where we began before, which is this was all about choice. It's a choice about what you're going to pay attention to and what you're going to ignore. I use that frequently in my hypnotic sessions about being able to eliminate by maintaining attention to what is true and moving away from things that are not true and what may be to come distractions. The reason I'm using this video is to help understand what occurs with stress. Imagine your mind as a container and in that container, you're gonna pour different color fluids and those fluids will represent different forms of stress. You know, blue might represent COVID, red might represent your responsibilities to yourself and to your family and the stress that's being caused as a result of not being able to go to work or not to go to work from any place else but home. And as all of those things are coming into your mind into this container, the volume of each of the stressors represents the impact it has, and a color represents the different qualities of stress. And when they all get into your mind, which eventually gets into your brain, it's a morass. Now, if I asked you to pull out the blue from that color right there, it would be hard for you to do so. So that's an example of what's happening. Stress is cumulative and progressive. One and one does not equal two. It equals some magnitude of that or some uh, factorial of that. Emotions can be occurring from a spontaneous experience. You're walking through the woods and a bear jumps out. You don't have to think about it, but emotions are also affected by what it is that you're thinking. So two ways of getting to emotional responses was either through your thinking or an event. The response is equally the same. And you can cause yourself to think about things or have emotional responses that are not true. So for a moment now, just imagine something uh, that represents a, a juicy flavor in your mouth, uh, a peach, an apple, a watermelon, a piece of steak. And if you were to imagine that right now, you would start to salivate. Now, because psychologists are weird dudes, we measure the amount of saliva. When you imagine a piece of fruit or food in your mouth and measure the amount of saliva, a piece of food is there. And what we find is that they're exactly the same. So we can't always trust what we think or believe. We can't always trust what we feel. And in that example there, the brain is being affected by what it is that we're thinking. So imagine now being bombarded with all the information that you're hearing about COVID and also all the emotion around not being able to function at your highest level, whether it's training for sport, playing a sport, uh, you're an athlete in high school or college or a professional athlete, a coach, a parent. All of those experiences now are being influenced by the mind, which is then going to bring it into our brain. This is Debbie Cruz's work. You've seen this before. And you can see on the left hemisphere, 
is uh, actually the heat of the brain. This is a PET scan on the right side of the brain where the emotions will be. So whether you think it or whether you have the experience that starts, it generates across both sides of the hemisphere, it becomes global. And the very first thing that it will do is influence your ability to analyze data. And what it will do for an athlete, it will tense up muscles. In any athletic performance, you have to tense muscles and relax them when this is occurring. If, if one of you can turn off your microphone, it's a little bit distracting by rustling papers. Thank you. So this will influence performance in an athlete because it will bind up muscle groups. So you need to be able to be coordinated. If that's occurring, agility, speed, uh, strength, and power will be affected merely by the amount of stress that you're having. So during a period of time that you're not training, you need to be able to use processes that will help you influence your brain functioning even when you're not on the field or on the course or in a gym. We're gonna look over some requisites of change and then we'll get into the presentation more specifically. There's only five factors, at least that I believe in that change is, is, is enhanced by or caused by maturation. Um, you couldn't pick up a cross stick, uh, I don't think, Mark, when you were two days old. Maturation mm -hmm. is essential. Coercion will affect change. We're all being coerced into being forced to stay into our homes. Uh, by the government. I'm not saying that's not what we need to do, but as a result of something outside of our control. So both in maturation and coercion, those things are outside of our control. Crisis, similarly, we're all affected by this crisis. We're different now than we were before because the crisis has influenced that, again, outso outside of our control. Discomfort. If you're not uncomfortable enough, you won't change. If you're too uncomfortable, you won't change. So even as a clinician, I have to try to, in my therapeutic process, is get people to feel just enough discomfort to change and not too much discomfort or they won't change. And the last one is the act of the will. Those are the factors that are gonna influence our becoming more effective in managing the environment. I've put together, with the help of Bob Knightifer's uh, attentional shifting and his uh, tastes, what I believe is intention is in influenced by our values and our personality. Those come together to influence what our intentions will be, which now starts the whole process. And if you know Bob's work, you'll know that it's broad external, narrow external, broad internal, narrow internal. And as you go through this process, depending upon the sport, eventually you'll go to narrow external where you finally will find optimal performance if you've utilize the process effectively. We finally reach COVID. And I found this model when I was doing the research for another presentation. It was an interesting question, who do you wanna be during this period of time? And so some people might start off here in the fear zone and may actually wind up here. But if you take a look at the whole concept of growth, so fixed mindset, growth mindset, Oh, the whole idea about um, how to be able to change your mindset. This is a choice. We go back to where we started before. What are you choosing to do? Where are you paying your attention so that you can use this period of time to see this as an opportunity to grow? Mark, let's bring you in right now and maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you've been doing as a professional athlete over this period of time. Awesome, and thank you. Uh, there was so much to take in there, and I was writing all along the way to stay with you. Uh, one of the most important things that I've ever taken away from you is this search of the truth or self-efficacy rather than uh, getting too caught up uh, in your emotional mind and being very emotional or reactive based on your feelings. Uh, I find myself questioning what my thought life is like with the 80,000 thoughts per day, and especially in a time of quarantine, uh, asking myself who I want to be. And one of the great words that I kept nodding along to as you were presenting there is intention. And I feel like words that come to mind throughout our society often are mission, uh, dream, uh, having a, a long-term goal, right? But I think when I think of the word intention, I think, how are we owning this day? What are we doing right now? 
your analogy of, of reading a paragraph a second time to actually intentionally pick up uh, what, what you should be in that paragraph. And you challenged everybody uh, at the beginning of this presentation to think differently. And I think if you are able to think differently and then act differently, and you are able to persuade yourself on, on who you want to be, over time you can re reach a state of not thinking, which is so important as a pro athlete. I, well, the last thing I want to do is step out onto a field uh, and, be, and be thinking too much. To answer your question in short, what have I been doing, uh, is very much focusing on uh, micro missions, is the word I like, to, I like to use, or being intentional with my days, right? I have that North Star vision in mind of who I want to be uh, years down the road. However, I'm very much staying in the moment with my micro missions and being intentional on the things I want to get done, whether that's uh, writing a gratitude letter to my grandparents, which I just did the other day, whether that's writing in my gratitude journal or getting my thoughts down on paper or making sure, and I'm taking this from Josh Waitskins, who is a global grandmaster in chess turned to uh, global world champ in Tai Chi push hands. And he wrote a book called The Art of Learning. And I read a book, the, uh, watched his video the other day about structuring your day like a peak performer. And three things that he talks about is one, being proactive. When I hear being proactive, that the word intentional comes back uh, to the forefront of my mind. Uh, the other two things that he talks about is what are your peak energy states? Most of our society gets caught up in, in making their day surrounding their meetings rather than focusing on their thought life. Like you talked about, thinking is like breathing. Well, how about we pay attention to the breathing? And how about we pay attention to our thinking a little bit more than chasing off to our next meeting to put fires out? And then the last thing that he talks about in structuring your day is end the day strong. Go to bed uh, with uh, an important question in mind. And that allows you to wake up the next day, brainstorm it on a little bit. And as, as he puts it, I love this metaphor, uh, to open the door between the conscious and unconscious mind. And that leads right back into what you were talking about before of the subconscious mind being in control of us. But I think if we are able to be intentional with our days, we can grab hold of our subconscious mind a little bit more. Mark, there's a, a comment here. Uh, what is the name of the person that you're speaking about, the, the author there that you would? Uh, that's Josh Waitskins, and the book is called The Art of Learning. And one of the most important things that he talks about in that book is that in every single endeavor or craft, there's two components, the tactical component. Uh, and you, like you talked about, Doc, uh, the maturation was definitely a key and I, me not picking up uh, the cross stick at two years old. But what's really important is the, is the psychological side, right? And that's what we're diving into deeply right now is if you only pay attention to the tactical component and get your body as a kind of a vehicle to get you to the next meeting, rather than pay attention to your thought life and your actions, um, it makes a world of a difference. Great, so during this period of time in uh, your preparation, I mean, it sounds like a lot of this is really mental for you. I would you're say so. Actually uh, making decisions to do that, I'm sure you're actually training as well. Um, and so then I also heard you know, in, in your writing, and it also sounds like there's a very specific process of goal setting. And certainly what I have found uh, with any of the individual I work with, you know, certainly with during competitive seasons and uh, now when they're not able to, is that the structure is really important. Um, so I'm sure that there has been uh, a lot of structure to your day and it looks like you're spending time and maybe even uh, meditating or using some imagery. Can you address imagery uh, for a little bit here? Absolutely. And as you were speaking about before, I was actually getting a somatic response in my hands because uh, this conversation is all about what to do when not competing. And I always have that urge uh, to compete. Um, so what change has happened? Well, I definitely think we're going through a crisis. Everybody would agree with that. And there is discomfort um, that has come about. Uh, so the imagery that I use is I search for uh, ever since learning that from Josh Waitskins, I searched for those peak energy periods. I think everybody knows if they're a morning person or a night person. And Josh Waitskins says it pretty much falls in line with that, those portions of whether you're a night or afternoon, wh wherever you have your peak uh, energy periods. Uh, and in those times, I'm very intentional. I wouldn't say that I'm burning uh, energy all throughout the day, uh, but I would say I have short bouts of intensity. 
short bouts of intentional intensity is an even better way to put it. And in those moments, I am doing uh, meditation. I am focusing on my breath. Uh, one, even a simple term or a simple uh, experiment that I was working on with my character coach, who was a, a Navy SEAL for two years uh, with the San Diego SEALs that I play professional box lacrosse in. Uh, there's many different breathing techniques, but he says the one that he uses with his Navy SEALs is just the simple number eight. And on the inhale, you're going up the infinity sign. And on the, on the way down, you're exhaling. And it's not uncomfortable, but it's just something that I've been adding to my, uh, to my schedule, to my structure, um, forcing upon a structure into, or else I'm just a plastic bag blowing in the wind. And that's one of the uh, little micro missions that I have every day is to do that controlled eight breathing that he's taught to me. You know, as I hear you speaking about this, I mean, you're, you're talking about it with uh, some imagery, right? So as you give some sense of maybe being blown in the wind enough that was chaff blowing in the wind. You know, that what we're talking about here is we opened up with um, Victor Frankl's uh, you know, book, Man's Search for Meaning. And what he found uh, with people were experiencing during the crisis of what was going on during the Holocaust was that there were several factors that really influenced them. And then first one was purpose. What's your purpose now? Is the purpose to get through the day? Is the purpose to use these moments as the opportunity to excel? You know, in my work, I never talk about winning. I always talk about excellence and execution. So if you excel and you execute, and if you're going to win, fine. But to me, it's about those things. So this, this, you know, to me is an important purpose. So what's your purpose? So he talks about purpose and he, and he also talks about love. And I always like to bring in the sense of belonging. We'll talk a little bit about that and how it actually affects your immunological system. And so purpose, belonging, and uh, love. And, you know, then there has to be courage. So I'm leading up now into kind of integrating, you know, Dweck's concepts of, um, you know, the mindset. And she talks about a fixed or growth mindset. And the image that I put up there before was all based upon that concept of your becoming. Um, so I would always recommend, you know, that book, uh, you know, Mindset by Dweck. And then the next book is uh, The Obstacle is the Way, which is an interesting concept. In the book, The Obstacle is the Way is that something's in front of you. It looks like it's thwarting you, but actually use, it's almost like an attraction. It brings you into the, the moment by being able to experience something you might not have experienced that way before. So this sounds philosophical. It is. At the core of you, you're, you are becoming who it is you want to become. And in the essence of you, there's a, there's a spirit, there's a center, which is the force that moves through you, that guides you. Some of this is subconscious. Those of you who may be gathering more of this information about trying to understand what your essence is during this period of time, and it's not only courage, but it is this energy source that drives you into becoming who you want to be. So there's your being, and there's your becoming, and the only way that you become who you want to be is by your doing. What are you doing in order to become the person that you want to be? If we're talking about this as high level performance, what are you doing to, during this period of time? Is your mindset fixed? Or are you going to use this opportunity to embrace it as a new beginning to use this opportunity to discover more about who you can become versus who you've been? Mark, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, that, that was just well said. Um, I'm, I'm writing um, everything down that you were talking about, being, becoming, doing. I mean, it's just absolutely critical to be that way. And uh, I think there's one way you can look at it uh, is be, do, have versus have, do, be. And you can be one of those individuals that says, uh, I can't be more until I have more. Or you could uh, visualize yourself of who you want to be first. Uh, and then what do athletes do? Oh, they exercise, they recover, they eat well, right? And then on the, on the back end of that is the outcome of what you will have. And that's the most important way of going about it. Uh, James Clear in his book, The Atomic Habits, he talks about the importance of your habit formation, starting with who you want to be. 
And the reason why that's so much so important is the probability of the outcome we want increases when we let go of the, the need to have it. And I love that quote, the probability of the outcome we want increases when we let go of the need to have it. And what that means to me is we need to figure out who we want to be rather than chasing two rabbits of what we want to have, right? Those are ever elusive. But if we work on our processes of becoming, like Dr. Nick just talked about, uh, we know who we are, we know who our being is right now. Being self-aware is very, very important. But then about becoming is knowing who we want to be, having a purpose as to why, and then taking the right steps in order to get to the byproduct that we shouldn't be focusing on at all. If we do the right things and become the right way, we will have what we want as a byproduct. Interesting, as you were talking about kind of letting go of things, right? So letting go is actually a form of control. And most people are not aware of that uh, because we all seem to have this need to be in control. I, I don't disagree with being in control, but letting go is another way of being in control. Your body maintains homeostasis by letting go of wastes every day. Your mind can do the same thing. Now you're in charge of your mind, as we talked about decision-making and selecting what we're going to be paying attention to. Do you pay attention to letting go of things that are no longer necessary? So if we go back now to this 80,000 thoughts a day, 80,000 thoughts a day, what are you spending your time doing? What, what's the purpose of having those 80,000 thoughts? Can you minimize them? Can you choose? Can you let go of the ones that are no longer necessary? Well, the only way you can do this effectively, I think, is when you have this goal about who you want to become and your optimal performance, what does that require? Uh, strength, power, agility, effective decision-making. So if you're a performer, if you're a coach, if you're a parent, You've made decisions about what's important to you. It might be an important time now to make a decision about adjusting what those values may be. As you go back to the model of knowing, you saw where those values integrate, interrelated with uh, what it is that you believe and finally do. This is an opportunity to become much more aware because you can't start without becoming aware. Much more aware of what's essential in order for your performance to increase. Identify those, if they're physical attributes, and certainly we're dealing with the mental attributes, what are those, outline them, and then we can go through the whole goal setting system in a little while. One, one thing I'll add to that, Dr. Nick, is, is an actual story from, from my life in, in which I was a, a junior at Yale University where the next day uh, was our Ivy League championship uh, at Brown. Uh, I did have a mental coach in which I went to go speak to, Brian Kane. However, uh, I had a hard time of becoming aware of what was important at that moment. Uh, I was trying to think positive, uh, and the further and further I got into trying to think positive in reading your slide there, choose to be see the positive. It's something that I was trying to do. Uh, I was uh, caught in between um, chasing thoughts and trying to control them is how I felt. And what uh, Dr. Nidefer talked about in the presentation earlier today about getting external. I think that is so critical in, in getting external at the right times, right? Getting external and, and choosing to be in the present moment, uh, especially when I was able to cross over the lines uh, and the game was going to begin and go on for 60 plus minutes. Being external at that time rather than getting internal uh, and too reflective and chasing my thoughts all around, uh, I felt like I was in more control. Uh, so an interesting uh, note here in the chat, in mindfulness nomenclature, it's sometimes referred to as observing self, our observing self, or notice or noticing self. A question we might ask to get in touch with this self is, if you are noticing your thoughts, who is, who is doing the noticing? Hence, there is a self apart from the thoughts, as our thoughts are not observing our thoughts. This is going to get very deep. Um, yeah, I That's would agree. That's very deep. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. And uh, I read it, so I'll make sure that everybody brought their attention to it. Um, thank you, Joe. So here are some um, management, stress management techniques. I wanted to make sure that we were um, addressing something very functional as well. I love the philosophical discussions, but let's be, for a few moments, addressing some techniques that we can use. 
stress is cumulative and progressive. And I kind of tried to uh, explain that in that image of the red and blue coming together and it just kind of but you're becoming a morass and it becomes more you know synergistic it becomes something other than just adding things together it does suppress our immunological system uh, my wife has been diagnosed with covid unfortunately we didn't have to do the whole hospital thing she was placed on the malaria medication did very well and five days after she had started medication she was coming off it she became very, very well for a brief period of time. But because she is an immunological condition, she has uh, Hashimoto's autoimmune thyroiditis, her immunological system was suppressed to begin with. So the first line in managing stress is managing the environment, the external environment. Don't watch too much TV. Um, and it's very hard to know what the truth is. And if you've seen any of the work that was coming out of Italy a couple of days, I only saw it once where they did the autopsies on the bodies that they didn't have the opportunity to do before. And what they found is that it was bacterial that killed the people and not the virus itself. It was causing blood clots. It's hard to know what the truth is. One of the best ways is to manage the environment. Part of what we have to do in the experience of managing the environment is obviously stay quarantined. Some of the things that we can do internally is by managing what we're thinking about. In the example before, don't think about pink elephants. Telling yourself not to do something will increase the probability of that happening. But are you spending time each day competing? Uh, you know, what we'll do with attentional shifting and competing images. So as soon as a negative thought comes up, you can compete with that with an image. And this will manage and reduce some of the amount of thoughts that you have. And I always like to use the metaphor of a, a remote control. So as soon as a thought comes in, change that thought, let's shift it over and let's have a, a pleasant image to compete with that. Um, you can dispute things just because you think it doesn't make it true. Just because you believe it doesn't make it true, just because you feel it doesn't make it true. So restructuring the way in which you think and competing with images uh, with those negative thoughts and using distractions. Scheduling is a really important piece, limiting the amount of time on task, changing the task frequently, exercise, mindfulness and relaxation techniques are simple ones that may help during this period of time. Some of you may be adolescents. I, I'm sure I know one of you that's uh, adolescent. Um, and during this period of time, this is a time of grieving. So for all athletes that are no longer competing, Mark, uh, I'd like to know a little bit about yours, but before we get to Mark, I've been working with an athlete that I thought would have been a national champ in his sport this year and obviously didn't have the opportunity to do so. I'm working with uh, an Olympian who was in a 2016 Olympics and we were preparing for the summer and um, obviously we've stop you know, some of his training, uh, but we'll get back on that. This is a, a period of time of grief. Grief is not only what you had and you no longer have. Grief is about what you dreamed you could have and you can't have. So an eighth grader going into high school won't have the experience of graduation, either a high school senior or, or a college senior. Uh, those athletes won't have time to, won't have the opportunities to compete uh, at the county or the state level, it may have been state champs or national champs. Um, and those who are getting ready to be recruited by colleges or professional teams, they don't have the same opportunities. When we look at what's going on in football, as you know, there are elite opportunities in all sports except football. You play for your high school team. What's gonna happen this year? So grieving is about what you had you no longer have. And so, we need to be paying attention to that. Parents need to be aware. And individuals that are going through this period of time, make sure you give yourself a time to, um, to, to grieve. Um, I'll do the next one, Mark, and we'll give you an opportunity to talk about this. One of the things I want to talk about is belonging. So if we just go right down here for now, belonging is an essential component Belonging only occurs through understanding. So when I was listening to Nidifer uh, earlier today, and when I was talking a little bit about Frankel, that the only sense of belonging comes through understanding. Understanding and belonging actually modify the impact that stress has on the individual. There's been some great studies that belonging demonstrates 
higher immunological functioning. You don't have your team. You don't have your friends. You don't have your family around you. Whatever you can do to enhance that. So there's a lot of things that are taking place on social media. So you can have Zoom parties or um, Zoom pizza parties or Zoom dancing parties. But belonging and understanding are essential pieces. Those of you without your teammates or your friends or your families, do the best you can by reaching out. I would encourage you, not unlike Mark was talking about writing a gratitude letter to one of his grandparents, writing versus typing is a very different process. NFL did this years ago. They gave out iPads, I think, when they first came out. And uh, the players were putting in their information on the iPad by, by using the keyboard. They switched shortly after that to pads where you can actually write because writing does something to the brain that the typing doesn't do. It, uh, it, it's a very familiar process to the brain. Writing is a very important process. Use it to express yourself. Mark? Thank you, Dr. Nick. And uh, due to Dr. Nick's uh, humility, he hasn't brought it up, but uh, one of the best reads is his book, Beyond the Scoreboard. I encourage that for every parent. Uh, and a student athlete out there. Uh, one of the things I've felt um, is definitely the change from this uh, COVID pandemic is the discomfort side of the change. And I was out in San Diego, I'm from New Jersey, and I was living out there playing for the San Diego Seals when our season came to an abrupt ending, suspended indefinitely, uh, and now has been canceled. Uh, we were also supposed to have the 50 of us for Team USA um, to, to compete in tryouts, and um, that has been pushed back. Uh, and then third and finally is the summer season, um, which was supposed to start up uh, on, on June 1 and has now got pushed back. Thankfully, uh, the Premier Lacrosse League will um, be live on NBC Sports, on NBC Channel 4 and NBC Sports Gold package um, from July 25th to uh, August 9th. So that is something to look forward to. Uh, that is something that I'm working towards. But there's the discomfort that I'm feeling is not just uh, mental. I think it's all encompassing in the fact that uh, there is periodization with my strength and conditioning, right? I'm, I'm prepping uh, my body so that I can hold on throughout the season, uh, get that two to three weeks of uh, recovery before I pick back up and get ready for the next season, right? So there's six months on, six mon months off of indoor box across uh, and professional across outdoors. And uh, I think uh, I don't want to say that I'm alone in this and the fact that there's many people that are having that similar uh, identity crisis and identity crisis of greater degrees. Uh, and I think it's very important, uh, like Dr. Nick just talked about, the grieving aspect is to give yourself closure, right? I know with my uh, indoor box team, we, we are having Zoom meetings and, and saying uh, we, we were onto something. There was momentum there of the back half of our season. But it's very important to give closure. Uh, and I like to say uh, there's no conclusions. They're just next chapters. Uh, so that's I'm picking up the pen of my life and getting ready for the next chapter. And, and that's going to be prepping for uh, July 25th uh, when the Premier Lacrosse League starts back up. Um, for a two-week championship series uh, on NBC. It's something that I'm definitely looking forward to, um, but that is not without uh, the discomfort uh, that was caused by this crisis. So it's definitely a change. And um, it's important, like Dr. Nick talked about, is to have those uh, ways in which you feel grounded in, in, a, in, a, in a time, especially where everything feels like uh, the ground is moving underneath your feet. Um. I, this might be too elementary for you, so I'm not sure who's on the uh, podcast or the webinar here about uh, goal setting. Um, I'd be glad to go over it. I'll do it very quickly. If there's any questions, um, please uh, just let me know. And uh, from this point on, which we have about 15 minutes left, it would be fine if we were to um, open your mics if you'd like to be noticed and as well, instead of my going back to the chat all the time. Outcome performance and process goals. Outcome goals are goals that are a little bit longer term. And it's always in contrast to where you've been to where you wanna be, simple. So you wanna be a state champ, you wanna be a national champ, you wanna be recruited, you wanna make the cut uh, that you haven't made before. Performance goals are always measurable. So the difference between those things, you have to measure certain processes, uh, you know, um, you have to measure certain outcomes before you get to the final outcome goes. So those things are always measurable 
and process goals are the very specific things that you have to do. The simple model, outcome, identify very specific performances that you have to get to, what are the very specific activities that you have to do which lead you to the performance and lead you to the outcome. Very simple. Um, is there, are there any questions about that? Doc, do you mind going in a little bit about uh, balancing the long-term goal versus the specific shorter-term measurable? Um, how an individual or what strategies they could use um, in order to uh, focus their attention from the outcome goal to the performance goal and vice versa? The outcome goal is always uh, in the future, right? So you can only get there by after doing very specific activities. Um, let's use golf. Uh, I know a lot about golf. So uh, you want to make the tour, or let's make it uh, simpler. You want to lower your handicap. And lowering your handicap means that you have to have more fairway hits, more greens and rec like, more greens and regulations, and fewer putts. Those are all measurable, right? So the performance goals are all measurable. And so then we have to look at what's the process is necessary. This is a true story about a player I worked with a couple of years ago. And, um, and he wanted to make the PGA Tour. He was on, at that time, the web.com tour, and he came to see me for putting. And so the process we worked on with him is because uh, he had to make more flag putts. That was a performance goal that he had to be able to accomplish. And then the process, I taught him how to utilize uh, his, the difficulties he had was going uphill. And one of, the, one of the drills I used with him was imagining the ball rolling, not the line of the ball. People will frequently use the line of the ball. Line of the ball only gives you the line. Rolling the ball gives you the speed. So as we integrated the process of his imagining what the ball would look like as it was rolling uphill, he would get a better sense of the energy that was required to roll the ball up and then have the ball go left to right or right to left, same thing with downhill putts. So the process that we worked on here was imagery. That led him to his performance goal of getting a lag putt, uh, able to get into the hole and an outcome at the end of this. Uh, he was number one in putting on the web.com tour and number one on up and down that year. So I uh, hope that clarifies it, Mark. No, it doesn't. Skills, challenge, balance. Um, you know, during this period of time, um, working on your mental game. And if you know this model, uh, I cannot pronounce his name, Sizika Mahali. Um, but Susan Jackson wrote Flow in Sports is a great book and I'd encourage you to read it. And it's simply put that skills and challenges where they're interacting will tell us your highest level of performance. If the challenge is relatively low and the skill is low, the person's apathetic. If the challenge uh, is low and the skill set is high, you get bored. If the challenge is high and the skill set is low, you become anxious. And when the challenge and the skill sets are high, you move to the flow state. Now, of course, the challenges I'm working with are mental challenges. It may be about regulating anxiety. It may, about, may be about being present. It may be about being able to be relaxed. It may be being able to use the technique I just talked about of imaging the ball rolling and the challenge of being able to do that under pressure. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this now, but I would certainly recommend uh, Jackson and Sick McAlley's book, um, Flow in Sports, if you haven't seen that. Let me see. Um, this is Julian from Costa Rica, by the way. Nice to see you again. Um, Mark, I, I, I remember your talk about, um, you mentioned Rumi and the four things you can do every day to become your ideal self. Um, and I'm wondering now in the times of uh, coronavirus, there's more time, and I've noticed myself to be overthinking more. Um, what are things you can do every day to try and lower those uh, thoughts? Dr. Nick, do you wanna take that first? I'm sorry, I was distracted. So um, I am an old man, I can't do two things at once. Please get that back to me because I was trying to get myself set up here. What, what would you recommend in terms of someone overthinking right now during this quarantine era? Oh, okay, so uh, let's go back now. And the, the intention is to reduce your thinking, right? Reduce thinking, reduce negative thoughts. And so a simple task would be is that for the next hour, your intention is to be, anytime a negative thought comes up, you're gonna correct it. And the task that I think is really the best one here is to compete with that negative thought with a positive image. So whatever it might be that you're looking forward to. So we wanna move from thoughts to images and try to keep track of that. Now what's gonna happen, it's gonna be a little bit difficult, but eventually you're gonna do that. 
And over a period of time, within two weeks, you will reduce your negative thoughts by 50% if you do that for one hour a day. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nick. Yes, I'm sorry someone was asking us a question, um, but we got tossed out. So um, the gentleman who was uh, from Peru, if he could get back on and ask me the question, I'm sorry. He might not have joined us. I think we lost a lot of people. And thank you for the question, Julian. The name of the book was Flow in Sports. Right. Thank you. Okay, we're just coming to an end here. So um, if you have a few more questions, um, this is my book and um, so I'll pitch it a little bit. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to have uh, Bob Papa, the voice of New York Giants, endorse it and Michael Breed. I work at the Michael Breed Academy and um, Tina Servasio, who's the uh, only female sports anchor on the, on the East Coast. Um, and uh, so I've got some good endorsements. It follows a, a lot of what I spoke to you today, about today. Um, my email will be appearing here, drnick at performanceinmind.com. Uh, so if you'd like to reach out to me, and certainly you can reach Mark by doing that. If you send them a note to me, I'll make sure I get it to Mark. Mark, forgot to put your email on here. That's okay. Dr. Nick, we have um, someone asking, do you mind going back to the square breathing slide? Sure. Now, there, you're going to hear different breathing techniques. Uh, this one, uh, to me, has been the best. Now, the reason... I like square breathing is because what, it's, what it does is it changes the rhythm of your heart, not the rate of your heart. So it's inhaling through your nose, inflating your diaphragm. Your diaphragm is located just below your rib cage. And if you imagine that there's a, a small balloon there, if you breathe in through your nose, you'll inflate your diaphragm, you hold your breath, you breathe out and you relax muscle groups, shoulders, neck, arms, do those separately and then don't breathe. Now, it's not important to breathe deeply. It is important to breathe rhythmically. I know Bob gave a, a different breathing technique of something, you know, when you're in the middle of performances, you may take in a larger breath and you'd be inflating your chest area, but if you're a golfer, you don't wanna raise uh, your chest, your shoulders up. I, I use this all the time. Heart math, if you're not familiar with that device, it does a great job of being able to help you uh, follow rhythmic breathing, measures it. Uh, I've used it with uh, an Olympic trial ice skater um, and, uh, and a gymnast. Uh, I find that, that piece of equipment to be very, very positive or very helpful. So we have a question here about um, a lack of motivation um, or feelings of defeat. So we want to not pay attention to feelings because when you pay attention to truth, so let me give you an example of this. Mark briefly mentioned efficacy. It's a true story. It'll, it'll get right to the point. We don't want your attention on how you feel about things because feelings don't always tell us the truth. A high jumper came to see me a day before competition. She jumped 5-4 in a junior year high school, jumped 5-2 in her senior year one day before competition. She wanted me to work with confidence, said we're not doing it. Confidence is overrated, doesn't have, actually tell us the truth. We looked at her films. She lifted up her head when she was going over the bar. Her butt dropped. She knocked the bar off. I asked her if she could keep her head back. She said yes. Next 45 minutes, I did drills with her on imagery, not of her getting over the bar, imagery of keeping her head back. The next day, she jumps five, six. We had nothing to do with motivation. We had nothing to do with any other execution other than one very specific attribute that she had to do. And I asked her, could she keep her head back? The answer was yes. That's efficacy. The truth is that she could keep her head down. I would suggest that you use truth about your performance, not how you feel about it. I understand motivation becomes a very important part. If we had time, I would show you my theory, which does not include motivation at all. I would extend in that Dr. Nick's self-efficacy and understanding it uh, and doing a deeper dive, I, I encourage you to reach out to him about self-efficacy 
efficacy has changed my life uh, as a pro athlete. Um, and it is true that your confidence and your feelings lie to you and you are not your emotions and your feelings right now. Uh, so I would encourage uh, following along and doc, I want to turn this back over to you potentially for one of the last questions here in uh, what strategies or things that are measurable uh, could people focus on right now? So one of the great things about uh, self-efficacy is uh, in, the, in the story you talked about is visualizing the imagery of tilting your, your neck back in that story. And that is in control, right? We can't control the weather or the traffic. So what strategies would you say that people should focus on um, from an imagery perspective? How could they measure that? What are some things that they could do? Okay, so um, three types of imagery internal imagery, what you are seeing, external imagery, what the camera sees, and then proprioception, your ability to feel your body uh, in a position in space. So, you know, whether you're swinging a golf club, um, running down the court, hurtling, whatever that is, you can image it from behind your eyes, and you can also image it from what's going on externally, and you can also feel it. How are we going to measure these things? Your experience with them phenomenologically. That's a hard word to say. Uh, my dissertation didn't have, a th didn't have a thesis, interestingly enough, because it was always, it was based upon our ability to understand our own experience with things. So if you look at, if you look at this whole process of what's called heuristic research, that it's, it's self-description. It is not statistical. There's more than one way to measure it. It's your own experience. Think about that you have the ability to tell yourself, to teach yourself what you know about yourself, not about what other people are telling you. I don't wanna get coaches out of a job. They're, they're, they're important in being able to tell us things. But our experience is so important. Let's not miss that. So that's the way I would measure it. It's phenomenological, use yourself well. Mark Glycini is markglycini at gmail.com. M-A-R-K-G-I-L-I-C-I-N-I gmail.com. Right, Mark? That is correct. Reach out to Mark or myself. We appreciate your time and attention. Uh, and uh, Dr. Christina Vasari, I know that you're on here. You know, I think the world of her, she's made a change in my life, uh, not just in my abilities uh, uh, to do sports psychology. Thank you all. Hope we hear Thank from you. you soon. Thank you, Dr. Nick. I'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. My email is drnick at performanceinmind.com. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. This was awesome. Thanks again, Dr. Prasari. Be well, everyone. Ciao.